presenter, Valerie, is a, um, she teaches at NWTC. She's a longtime organic farmer. So she's going to talk with you about um, soil and what you can do to amend your soil organically. So for you folks that are here to, to just learn about how to make a better personal garden in your yard, but you're not really interested in, in converting your yard into a field of white corn, you're welcome to stay. We want you to stay. We want you to grow healthy food. And we want you to have a really great lunch with us. But then we need you to go so that this room is way too small for this amount of people. And we really have a lot of work to do as a white corn growers group. So you're welcome. You're here. I'm glad you're here. Um, we have two grants that we're working off of today. And um, so with those grants, we have responsibilities. So that's why we had you signed in. And we asked you directly if you grow white corn or not, because we need to record that kind of information. So our white corn group, um, I started like just interviewing people at the oh not at the in the, the the tribal food summit that we had at the Radisson last fall. And I got about twenty five people that I talked to, but there's still a lot of people that I haven't addressed yet that I haven't been able to ask questions of. So I'll be coming to you and knocking on your door and, and begging for your information. Um, so what my intention is is to have a healthier seed stock for us to be able to share seeds with each other, to make the seeds, make the corn stronger. Um, if you grow the same seeds year after year, after year your, your, your gene traits start to diminish and you have a diminishing field, so you really need to um, share seeds with each other so that you can keep your seeds viable. Um, there's also um, information you need to know about keeping your seeds viable is not letting them go over the temperature of 90 degrees because they become sterilized. So there's these little things that we can share with each other as growers um, to make sure that we get good crops. When I interviewed the growers in our community, the most successful farmers used fish emulsion to fertilize their corn. And they had really beautiful green, lush um, corn stalks and they had really big corn on there. So um, part of the white corn growers, they're in uh, the grant that we apply for and that's why we're buying the, the sprayer for that. So. so I think it might help to clarify that this is a community project, not a tribal government project. Right, right. So this is, uh, a group of <laughs> a group of ten people that, that I convinced this would be great if we applied for this grant. Let's go do this together, kind of thing. So that's the group that's meeting after this, and uh, we've got a ton of support though from the community and or from the government. But it's not the, the government's not funding this. We're all here on our own time. We all brought our own food in. We're using a tribal space that anybody can use a community space. But this isn't um, this isn't a program paying for anything. We're, we're kind of here on our own. So Val did not grow up on a farm. She hung out at her aunt and uncle's farm when she was a kid. And she got her master's in agronomy from UW-Madison. And then she married a farmer. So that's how, this is how it gets started. And they have a, they dairy farmed for 25 years. And currently Val is teaching sustainable agriculture at the technical college. And she started that in 2010. So I want to thank Val for coming in on a Saturday, not getting paid to be here. Yay! <laughs> so um, you can go ahead and, and can you click. Get the lights there? I guess the thing I want to tell you is is just right over here at the Tech College. Um, five years ago, I did get the opportunity to start a, a program for people who want to learn to farm again, and even on a very small scale, and even on a garden scale. And uh, right now, uh, also, I do have uh, two students from Oneida who, oh, yeah, and we're, and, yeah, there's Christy. Yay, Christy. So, um, anyway, also, tobacco, we need to talk about that. Anyway, all right, we can go. So, let, just, just take a second oh. to answer these three, these four questions really quickly on the top of your page. Just, you know, yes or no, maybe, whatever the answer is, because we need to identify what you've learned from this workshop as part of our grant. Oh. Okay. So just real quickly, if you could just answer that. And the idea is that you're not supposed to know the answers to the questions because you haven't heard the presentation yet, so don't feel bad about yourself. If you say, I don't know, that's okay. If you just write, I don't know across the four questions, you write, I don't know. <laughs> Give me something, you guys. Come on, I don't know is good. At the end. Yeah, we're going to have those handed you have any more sheets later? Yes. And then uh, oh, one more thing before you start again. Chaz wants me to mention that we have to grow beans and squash as well. 
I'm just focusing on whiteboards. Somebody step up and take paint and squash. I'm doing that. <laughs> And that actually has something to do with um, this presentation. I'm going to talk mostly about healthy living soil, and that's really all you need to grow good food. And I just want to run through a little bit here at the beginning about um, soil not becoming a pollutant. And then you all know what nature knows. There's a lot of wisdom there already, and the soil is going to grow the plants for you. So here's my favorite definition of soil. The word at the top says soil that it is an interface between the living and the dead. And that's, that comes from um, a book that I read, a textbook, Foth is the inst instructor with that book. But I like it because it really is an intersection where things that were, what we think of as dead, become alive again in the soil. So here's another way I like to look at soil, that when we eat plants or animal life, anything that comes from the soil, we actually take the, that in our mouth and we bring it through this tube called our guts. And that's really our, our way of the external environment coming inside of us, becoming part of us. And then, you know, we, we sometimes refer to poop as soil. You soiled your diaper when you were a baby. And I just want that concept of what what was dead becomes alive in us again uh, to kind of lay a foundation for what soil is to me. And I want to emphasize this, that soil has a structure that's really fragile and is easily crushed. And I like to think of soils as if it's a bunch of grapes. And you know how fragile they are. And you want to pay attention mostly to the space in between the mineral particles of soil. That's just as important as the particles themselves, is the space in between. And yet, here's what we're doing. In a lot of Brown County and this watershed and, and the reservation, we're, we're running really heavy equipment and we are squishing our soil. We've been treating our soil like dirt, mm. and we really are treating it like it's just this physical structure. It's just there, and we are going to put the nutrients, and we are going to make the plant grow. And I don't think that's the way nature works at all. I think we're going to change that idea. But that's currently what agriculture thinks. It might as well be sand. And then we just put the nutrients right there and we grow the plant. I don't think that's a good way to look at things. Because this is what happens. This is the Bay of Green Bay in the springtime. When all the soil washes off all these fields. So we had those nice thunderstorms the other night. Mm -hmm. You saw how the creeks were all running brown? That's where it all ends up. Because the, every drop of rain splashes on the bare ground and splashes up soil particles, and there she goes into the bay. So this is actually from your own environmental department. A lot of different studies have been done. 70% of this erosion problem comes in just 17 days in the spring and fall. So when we get those gully washers like we just had, the, the thunderstorms, that's one of those 17 days. There's no crops growing. Everything just runs right down into all these little streams and ditches, and there she goes. Uh, that's just another picture of it, an unprotected field, and it's, it's not planted, and that's what a lot of our fields look like. There's not even much slope there, but look at There's a little bit of a buffer here, but just overwhelmed. And then we get, um, we get flashiness in our creeks. We get erosion and flooding, and then we get the, our clay soils here, get hard-baked cracks in them. And we get annual crops like corn and soy. We're growing them year after year after year. We're taking too much out of the soil and not putting enough back, and this is our result. So we get soil and its sediments, a lot of manure, especially in this area, a lot of nutrients. All the nutrients are going into the, uh, specifically phosphorus and nitrogen. They're going into the bay. They're not staying on the land. And this is actually a quote from when I worked here 20 years ago. And one of my office mates had this quote in his cubicle. And I really liked it, and it stuck with me all this time. That sometimes I feel badly because I can't do enough to help things and fix things. So what about your soil as gardeners and organic corn growers or white corn growers? Here's the, the five keys I, I want you to think about. Or, or maybe, maybe this will be what changes from what you 
wrote at the top of the sheet to what you write afterwards. Treat soil as if she's fragile. And, and treat her like a person, not an it. Um, add compost to improve. We're going to go through these a little bit step by step. But add compost so you get that grape-like structure. You want air space and pore space as much as you want nutrients in the soil. So when you do this, then you make habitat for soil life. And then you're going to let the little microbes and bacteria and springtails and fungi, you're going to let the soil life itself grow nitrogen, and you're going to let the soil feed the plant. It's not going to be us feeding the plant. Soil is going to feed the plant. So this is just another picture showing um, the soil, like imagine again, these are the grapes and their particles. And you really need the pore space here for um, a root to grow into. So this is a big picture of the root. This is just a close up of the root with little root hairs on it. And these root hairs need to be able to get to the whiter spaces here. That's air space. And they need to get to water. And then they also get to, um, access the nutrients that are the little soil particles. So they need three things when they're looking for the in-between spaces. And th this just has to do more with these minerals um, exchanging off a soil particle. We're not going to go into this, but it is called cation exchange capacity. And some of the soil tests I like include a term called cation exchange capacity. You won't see it on many tests. Um, and I'll maybe explain that term if we have time later on. But um, yeah, right now we'll just kind of keep rolling through here. Uh, this is a root tip. And these are actual hairs off the root tip. And did you know roots are not, not like your skin? We tend to think of a root or a plant like your skin, where it keeps everything inside of here. And it's very discreet, and there's um, fluids and blood and all, all kinds of your stuff is inside the skin. Well, roots are not like that. Roots are leaky. They're leaking all the time. And what they're leaking out are cakes and cookies, which is really a lot of sugary substances or carbohydrates. They're leaking that into the, the nearby soil. And why are they doing that? To feed the microbes? Yeah, so the next picture is showing um, that they're, they're attracting bacteria. And then these really good bacteria, we tend to think of bacteria as harmful, like having a lot of you know, pus or ooze or yucky things. But I was very probably weird in college back in Madison back in the day, because I wanted to study the good bacteria. Nobody was studying the good soil bacteria. But that was, those were my favorites. And what they do is they make glues and the things called glomulants. And they, they actually, um, glue particles of soil together so you get a nice crumbly structure, a nice aggregate, and it's starting to look like those grapes again, where you're going to get pore space in between everything. Go ahead. So when you start increasing soil organic matter, that's OM, for every 1% organic matter that you increase in your soil, in your garden or in your farm field, um, this is just an example of what you do with that. That organic matter acts like a sponge. And let's see, what's a, uh, a square yard would be about the top of one of your desks here. And if you dug down a foot deep, you could add four and a half gallons to that soil if you have 1% organic matter. If you have 2% organic matter in your soil, you can add nine gallons of water. That's a lot of water to store in that soil, which also explains why it's all running off into the bay is because we've lost all our organic matter. A, a native soil that just is um, sort of really good under a forest, that might have 7 or 8% organic matter. Ted, what's some of your good soils have over at Jin Hinkle, your really high organic matter soils? Don, okay. 2.6. 2.6. That's, that's your best? That's what you got? I mean, that's not bad, because a lot of the farm soils around here have 1%. And I have a colleague in the farm business program who says you can't increase organic matter in farm soils. It's oh. always going to go down, 
because of tillage and you burn that you burn the organic matter up out of the soil but on our farm which is organic farm we've increased our soil organic matter or kept it the same and we like to be at three and a half four if you can get up to five percent organic matter just imagine how much water you can store in your soil at five percent organic matter when you lose the organic matter out of your soil this is what you get if you lose three percent of your organic matter you lost 54,000 gallons of water per acre. Mm -hmm. So most of you are probably about like me. You've been around long enough that <clears throat> when, when does our water shut off? We have, we have springtime rains, rains. When does the water shut off? About July. About July. Anyone else? My marker, I have a marker. I live out by Hoffa Park. There's always a Father's Day chicken dinner on June 21st. That's when the water shuts okay. off. For, for us, yep. I mean, but it, July, no, it, it, June, it, it, July, it, it, yep. Right, yep. yep, it stops, and we go dry. And then the soil starts baking down, and we don't have that, that lake of water in our soil because we've lost our organic matter, and then everything gets drought stressed. Mm -hmm. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is um, pointing out organic matter and compost, if you can keep that going in your garden soil, that'll get you a long ways towards not getting droughty. Yeah. You mentioned tillage, putting the organic organic matter in there, and then if you till, you're defeating the plants. Yeah, somewhat, but you also have to get it in there. So, I mean, there's a balance between over tilling and not tilling at all. Um, on our farm, we're exclusive grazing, which means we don't till the fields. We keep the living roots and we keep the cover crops. Every six, five or six years, we'll go and till the soil, <coughs> turn it over. Yeah. You ever plant, uh, plant winter wheat and then plow it under? Yep. That's, okay. there, there's cover crops, and we're, we're going to get to that. Oh, okay. um, it's not just winter wheat, but there's other things you can do to improve your soil. And then you do need tillage. But if you till annually, year after year, corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans, you're going to start burning that organic matter. You literally burn it. It's a fire you can't see, but you oxidize it. You burn it out of your soil until you start looking like this. And the climate scientists, you know what they're telling us about what's going to happen in the next couple decades here? The patterns are going to go towards, we're actually going to be wetter here. So you might say, well, this is not going to be a problem. But what they're saying is all the rain's going to come in the spring and in the fall, and we're going to get even drier in the middle in the summertime. So this is going to be an increasing problem so I'm talking partly farm here, but partly garden. And so if you're growing fields of white corn, you've got to plan for that and, and plan how you're going to keep that, that sponginess, that organic matter in the soil. OK, so here's my formula for building soil, is increase the organic matter. Um, the main ingredient I would add that you may or may not have would be the lime your soil to get the right pH. And I do have some handouts. Um, Maybe we'll duplicate some more in a little bit here, but um, about getting the pH right. So pH should be 7, that's neutral. And we actually want our pH to be a little bit on the acid side, 6.5, because when we're a little bit acid side, uh, the nutrients uh, go into what's called a soluble form, where the plants can take them up better. Uh, we're actually a little bit on the, on the um, base side because we're on this dolomitic limestone here. Mm -hmm. So on our farm, our soils run in the sevens, 7.2, um, 7.5. Uh, so we have to lime, because lime is, will, will help get our, uh, actually, I'm saying that wrong. You need to lime if you're too acid. So we do grazing. Now, not, not every one of you can do grazing, especially in your backyard. <laughs> Um, chickens. Dogs. Chickens. Yeah, I'm a little cautious about dogs and, and composting dog manure. Yes, I agree. They're, they're carnivores and they tend to have a little bit of worms going on with them and, and cat poop as well. Um, I'm not sure I want to compost that. Uh, human manure, not sure I want to compost that. Um, we have a composting toilet at our cabin up north and, you know, theoretically there's nothing wrong with human manure but there's just something a little 
like, yeah, we all kind of get a little weird about that. Um, but we have animals. Um, chickens are a great idea. If you got chickens, you can run them through your backyard. They'll be adding a lot of phosphorus to your soil as well. Um, rabbits, rabbits would do the trick. Uh, you got a horse, run some feed through your horse and collect that manure. Um, Don? Is there a space of time that's safe when you apply manure to when you should or could harvest? Yeah, there's actually rules um, in the, if you're trying to be certified <coughs> organic, um, you would have to put composted manure on no more than 90 days before you would harvest a crop for human consumption. And it, it gets a little bit different about applying manures um, if it's a leafy crop versus a root crop. <coughs> Uh, that's that's a little bit more on the, the rules side of things. But we always compost our manure over winter. So right now we've got a big long windrow from here to those buses, long of manure from last summer that we piled up in a windrow and we turn it over with a bucket on our skid steer or tractor. Um, it's, it's manure and it's straw from the cow's bedded pack. And then we actually donate quite a bit of that to the Green Bay Garden Blitz for doing these raised bed gardens <coughs> in the backyard. Um, but here's what you can do, is you can plow down your cover crops. And, and you mentioned winter rye, but I like legumes, because legumes are going to be adding nitrogen to your soil, as well as covering things up. It's a little bit hard to get some of these established. Um, how long a, a day corn is white corn? 100. 100 day corn? 110. 110? Yeah. And, in organic systems, we don't want to get our corn seed in the ground too early because the, the soil temperature should be 60 degrees before you put corn seed in the ground. And at 60 degrees, you, we actually have soil thermometers. You just go out there and stick the thermometer in the soil. And if it's colder than 60, um, the seed might rot instead of germinating. So we want to be at 60 degrees um, in organic systems. And in your white corn, you don't put that pink coating on the corn, right? What's the pink coating for? Antibacterial? It's uh, antifungicide. And, and antibacterial, it's anti-life. It's anti a lot of things. And so it, what it does is um, keeps your, your back, the bad bacteria, the pathogens, from working to break down that corn seed. We don't use that in an organic system. So we actually um, plant usually two weeks later than all our neighbors plant their corn. Because they, they have the pink seed, we don't have the pink seed, so we just wait two weeks till the soil is warmed up. So it's, that's working with nature. So that's usually um, on Mother's Day. This is how I mark things, Father's Day, Mother's Day. <laughs> it's, it's the only way I can remember stuff. But on Mother's Day is usually when we're taking that all our compost from the winter and we're spreading it on our fields on Mother's Day weekend. And then we'll plow that down along with, with the hay crop that was there or the grazing crop that was there. And then you want to wait two weeks because what happens is if you plow something down, you've just fed all the soil bacteria this wonderful, wonderful meal, and they are busy stuffing themselves and creating a, a whole nutrient cycle that's tying, tying up all the nutrients in their little bodies. And you want to wait till till they run their course and about two weeks later they start to die off and their little bodies then are little sacks of food. So when you plant your seed and when your seed starts to germinate and grow, then your plant has the proper nutrients. It's not tied up by the bacteria. <coughs> yeah? We have an invasive plant that, um, do, they, do they feed off of that manure and stuff and what is a lugami? A, a legume, legume is yeah. is um it it has um a way to take nitrogen out of the air. So its roots have nodules that are actually bacteria, and those bacteria can grab nitrogen out of the air. They fix it into the roots, and then when you plow that that legume down, you just fertilized nitrogen into your soil. What's so an example yeah. of the legume? Yeah. Clover, alfalfa, mm -hmm. Where are we? peas. Yes. Wheat is a grass. Yeah. But, but wheat, if you plow down wheat, you still got the green 
leafy part, which has nitrogen in it. And that would supply some nitrogen to the soil, to the bacteria. Peas, yeah? Beans, soybeans. Beans, <coughs> soybeans, not so much because soybeans are grown annually, so they don't get a chance to really develop their legume nodules. So you, if you can get stuff that's been a perennial legume, the clovers, the alfalfas, that have been growing there for more than a year, you're going to have lots of nitrogen in the soil. We're going to actually look at how much. So that's, thank you for that question. So if there's any other terms I kind of skip over, please let me know. And then this guy says oh, hemp. I'm sorry, what? This guy says hemp. Hemp? Magic. Hemp is not a legume. I know, it's a magic plant. It's a magic plant, but not a legume. <laughs> He just wants to throw it in the He just, just, just <laughs> try, and, try and throw me off the trail. My name is Ted. The small grains are things like oats and barley, and what we do is use those as nurse crops. So if you've grown corn one year, the next year don't grow corn on it again, especially your white corn. Well, start start with a field. A green growing field. Plow it down. That's all your nitrogen. Almost all your nitrogen you need when you plow that down. And then, bef even, okay, um, then you can plant your corn into it. But when your corn is done, what are you going to plant? You're going to plant your, your wheat, winter wheat or a small grain. So come back the next year and plant oats into that as a nurse crop and then restart your pasture plants in your legumes and your clovers and alfalfas. They're called nurse crops because they're grasses. They grow up really fast, they keep the weeds out, and they, they nurse along our legumes that we really want to grow. Um, we also use a lot of mowing. So if you have, need to get some income from your land and you plant it to a pasture, you can harvest that for hay so you don't get the weeds going in it. Um, you cut hay fields three times a year, and then you don't get so many weeds going, and you can sell that crop, or get a horse, or <laughs> do something. Run, or get a few beef cattle, not the naughty kind, the good kind, <laughs> <laughs> and just feed the beef. And then you've got you've got poop and you've got meat. What more could you ask for? Um, get some hogs. Get a couple hogs. Go to Fleet Farm. Get some hog panels. Uh, these six foot high things, they're, they come uh, maybe 12 feet long from me to 10. And what you do is you take that hog panel and you bend it in a U shape or, and, or a three sided thing. Is there a whiteboard yep, here? There's one, there's, here's a marker for you. And there's a board by a <laughs> Um So you take that long panel and you bend it into a U shape like this. And you get another one and you bend it like this. You tie it here really good and you put three piggies in here. <laughs> Actually put two or four because they like to be buddies and they want to be in pairs. Two or four. Put your piggies in there, tie this up too, and move them around your yard and let them eat that white stuff for you. Because look at, look at how much space they're taking up. They're only taking up all together, about as much as these tables, you're growing a pair of pigs in there, they're taking care of your problem, and you got pork at the end of the summer. No. <laughs> yeah. I should have just asked her about a, getting a puppy, now she can get a pig. There you go. They're, just don't name them. <laughs> or give them bad names. Our daughter named our last pair of pigs, um, Exxon and Valdez <laughs> made it easier when it was time. <laughs> All right, so here's my bottom line, is if you can, grow your own nitrogen, don't buy it. We organic farmers, we improve our soil by increasing that organic matter, and then we're making more nitrogen available to our plants. We're increasing our soil livestock. So I like to call the critters in the ground the livestock that gives us a positive way of looking at them instead of like those scary icky things in the ground. They're livestock. They're macro and micro fauna. Fauna just means animals um, that live below the surface. And they're going to concentrate nitrogen in their little bodies 
And then when they die, they are these little gummy bears of delight. That's what I'm calling them. So we're going to talk a little bit about the specific nutrients and fertilizers because this is what many gardeners want to, to know. I'm kind of warming you up on the nitrogen idea that you're going to grow your own. You're not going to be adding a lot of it. But I want you to think about this, about Mother Earth having grown all these plants all these millions of years. Does she need any fertilizer to do that? No. So why do we need fertilizer? It's because we're um, we have to replenish what we remove with crops. So when we take crops off the field and we take everything off the field, we're removing the nutrients with that. So in your home garden, as long as you compost and recycle and use green manures, you actually should not have to add any fertilizers, almost zero. Might need to add a little calcium. Can you go back one? <laughs> might need to. Um, you might need to buy a little calcium occasionally for some of your fruiting plants. Uh, maybe strawberries, tomatoes, they get that blossom end rot. Um, and that is because the fruiting body um, wants a lot of calcium. It's a reproductive tissue. And so that's the thing you might need. You might need a little, we're going to talk a little bit about phosphorus, a little bit about potassium. But <clears throat> if you're getting your nitrogen correct from your green manures or your animal manures, there should be enough phosphorus and potassium in there too. Okay, now you can go. All right, so here's the way I think of plants. That really, um, a plant is nothing more than taking carbon dioxide, that we're all breathing, it's in the air, taking water, it's got to rain a little bit. We take the sun, we add some electrons or some energy to that, and then in the stepwise process, <coughs> including some minerals that we get from rocks, so that's minerals here are added into the system. What are we doing with carbon dioxide and water and sunlight? Dunk, 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 dunk. You know what CH2O stands for? That's a carbohydrate. <coughs> so we just made a carbohydrate. We also took one of our waters. So we start out with two waters over there. And one of our water, um, one of our waters is extra. The plant releases that. And one of our waters, um, the hydrogen stayed in there to provide energy, and it became oxygen. So that's how a plant turns CO2 into O2. And this whole process gives us a plant. And we just need a little bit of fertilizer, minerals coming from the rock. Next slide. So how much do we need? Well, these are our macronutrients. We don't even think of them as nutrients. Has anyone ever told you to add hydrogen or oxygen to your garden? Because where do you get it? You get it from the air. So if I was to look at this room, I would say all of you could be, all of you could be oxygen, all of you could be carbon, and maybe we'd make the back row our hydrogen. That's what a plant is made up of, is you guys in the middle here. That's our, look at what percent that is. A lot. Big percent. And what we get from the soil is just 1.5% is nitrogen. So maybe three of you, we'll make four of you would be nitrogen pieces that we need for our plant body. Uh, the other three of you could be potassium. We need just one person is calcium. Maybe we, where's some of those? The kids, you could be magnesium, <laughs> phosphorus, and sulfur. Just a little bit of you guys. And then even, these are micronutrients. We hardly need them at all. Your soil should supply these micronutrients without a problem. So you would be the rest of the soil that's supplying all these other nutrients that we need. You might occasionally, in some special circumstances, run out of boron and have to supplement or a little copper and zinc once in a while, hardly need them. So you see how much of this room is just coming from macro, from things you don't even need to supplement. So what we really need to supplement is usually a little of this, a little of this, and a little of that. Okay, next slide. These are micronutrients. I, I won't take the time to go through them all, but the concentration is measured in parts per million. 
al almost always found in the native soil. And I just want to put in one caution in here. If you're using Roundup herbicide, or this is part of the problem with Roundup Ready crops, is the way they actually work is they chelate, or they tie up. So where's our little micronutrients? Like three gals back there, would you stand up your micronutrients? <laughs> what if you were the micronutrients? And now, let's say Chaz is, is Roundup. <laughs> Go round them up. Go round them up and make them not available to our plant. That's all you do. That's your job as an herbicide. And so our plant doesn't have those three little things. And you know what those three little nutrients are helping do? They're helping build a strong cell wall. And so when a plant doesn't have a strong cell wall, what it what actually happens is that's like um, then a pathogen can bore a hole in it and knock over the plant and kill it. And so Roundup Ready plants are just plants, yeah, you gals can sit down, are just plants that have a plan B. So they have a gene inserted into them from a bacteria. So the, for me, the problem with Roundup Ready or GMO plants is that you're taking what should normally be a plant, and if you crossbreed it with another plant, I don't care, that's crossbreeding. We do that all the time. We've been doing that for Thousands. Hundreds of years. Thousands. Hundreds of thousands of years. But what I don't like is we'd be taking a plant and we'd be taking a bacteria, a gene from a bacteria, and splicing it into that plant. And that bacteria has a plan B. And it says, okay, Chaz has those three micronutrients rounded up. I'm going to go a different direction, and I'm going to get my micronutrients with plan B over here. I'm going to come and put them in my cell wall. And that's why Roundup Ready plants can can exist. So that's not necessarily, you don't need to know that for gardening, but I think a lot of people don't understand what a, a GMO crop is. But when we're eating that, and we have cells in our own body, it's a very important issue. It is. Health. Yep. And that's where most people understand and don't care for genetically modified organisms, the GMOs, because we're afraid that when we're putting that in our guts, and we've got bacteria in our own guts, and what are we doing in, in there? What did we put inside of us? Yeah. What external from the environment did we just run through our bodies that we don't even know what we're doing? Yeah? I thought they banned Roundup. I thought, I thought they don't use it no more. Nope. Uh, it's used all over the place. Oh, it is. 90% of your crop plants, corn, soy, uh, even potatoes, are genetically modified and they're Roundup Ready. Uh -oh. I think you're getting that mixed up maybe with DDT or something like that. Uh -oh. Maybe, because they have banned some pesticides. This is an herbicide. Um, and, and no, it's actually the use was supposed to go down because people thought, well, we'll, um, we'll have all these GMO Roundup Ready crops and we only have to spray a little bit. But it turns out we've increased our use of this herbicide because we just planted so many more acres to it. Okay, we can go on. All right, so this this maybe gets a little um, further than what you wanted to know, but these micronutrients, so those, those three little tiny people back there, the thing they're doing is actually helping the plant take carbon dioxide and water, cascading it through a very set of controlled steps from this wild excited state down to a pool down at the bottom where it becomes carbohydrates in the plant. And they're doing it by being part of molecules like um, chlorophyll. Here's a chlorophyll molecule. And at its center, it has a magnesium. So the rest of it's made up of all kinds of other stuff, more carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogens. This is the molecular model for it. Um, and there's just one magnesium in the center. So do you see why we just need a little bit of it? But it's very central. Here's our own blood and a uh, hemoglobin molecule. And it looks a lot like chlorophyll, but at the center of ours, we have iron. So they're very similar in structure. And what they do is they are 
pigments in plants, and they just carry these um, high energy excited electrons down to a lower state, but we, we like to eat them because we know when we eat them and we see these bright colors, we know that we're eating micronutrients. That's really good for us. So that's why we're attracted to these pigments. Okay. Oh, there's more things micronutrients do with enzymes and so forth. They connect things up. But my point is that you just need a tiny little bit of it to be the little enzyme key that turns this and, and, and makes some new products in the metabolism of a plant. Now here's our macronutrients. N stands for nitrogen. P is phosphorus and K is potassium. And they're needed in the highest concentration by the plants. And they are typically not supplied by the soil alone in a bigger cropping system. And so that's why they're added as fertilizers. How many of you have heard of NPK that you add and it's on the bag of, of fertilizer that you would buy for fertilizing your lawn or something like that? Um, lawns don't even need it necessarily, but we like to have real pretty lawns, so we, we add it. But the corn and soy growers would be adding this all the time. Uh, the other three macronutrients are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur that plants need in just that little bit more. I showed you that other chart. Okay. Um, just real quick, phosphorus is um, an important molecule in DNA. So if you're going to build DNA, you need phosphorus. Can go on. Um, uh, permaculture, energy flows. Um, basically, what I'm trying to show here is we're using phosphorus to knit together carbon and hydrogen and turn it into carbohydrates. And we need this energy transfer molecule. How many people have heard of ATP? The P in ATPs is phosphorus. And so we, we need it as an energy molecule. I guess that's the bottom line. That's the role of phosphorus in the plant. So does anyone know what phosphorus deficient corn looks like? What's the, what's the symptom? Darn, what's the symptom? It's color. What color is it? Purple. Yeah, that's it. Where is it purple? It's purple at its growing tips. Because if it's an energy molecule and it's trying to use energy to grow, it can't keep growing. and it, it turns purple. It, it's just weird. I don't know exactly why, but that's a real good indicator of phosphorus deficiency, especially in corn. So those of you who are white corn growers, you watch for that in your fields. I had a good teacher. Who's that? Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. okay, so this is just an, uh, one more way of looking at this whole capturing carbon dioxide in water making our carbohydrates. What happens when we go in the reverse order and we're not capturing our energy slowly like a stepwise waterfall? What happens? What do we burn? We burn wood. That's a captured carbohydrate, right? We burn it, we're releasing flames. So we're just doing the opposite of that sunlight and capturing it. We're releasing the, the energy and the flame as, as wood and, and as, as flame. And what's left in the bottom of the pile? All that's left is the ash, the minerals. And that's potash. Who's heard of potash? Probably likely a lot of folks. No? Not a lot of folks have heard of potash? Um, it's potassium. It's the ash left after you burn the wood. So does that mean you can add wood ashes to your field as a source of pot yes. potash? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to be a little careful because it can also change the pH. So I wouldn't add a ton of it to your garden. I would sprinkle it more than add a lot. But you could save all the wood ash you wanted and use it um, on some of your white corn fields then. Uh, this is the role of potassium in the plant. <laughs> I just think of it as Gatorade. So, or um, if you're sick and, and you need electrolytes, um, and, and you want to drink something sugary with a lot of electrolytes in it, uh, that's Gatorade too, and the plant needs it in the same way. Uh, next slide. So that explains two things. Why do we need ATP? We're, that's what we have to expend to put a little P right here.
to make this little pump work. And this is a cell and a cell membrane. This is inside the cell, that's outside. Salt kills plants because you got too much sodium. And the sodium gets in the channel and, and the plant can't kick it out like it needs to. So we need potassium to come in, change the shape, and get inside the cell and then be used inside the cell. So I mean, th that's kind of a cool, simple explanation of how some of these things work. Um, but the main idea is just to think of a potassium pump and that we need electrolytes like potassium and so the plant does need some potassium. It should get most of that definitely from manures, but if you don't have manure, from green manures. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is this is DNA. Nucleotide is, we've got it, there's, there's more of our phosphorus right there, but the backbone of, of this thing is nitrogen. So it's, it's a, I guess I'm just trying to show you where nitrogen is used in the plant, in DNA. So you can't reproduce if you don't have nitrogen. Go ahead. Oh, this is just more, um, nitrogen is in every protein. So amino acids, the, the word amino and nitrogen are sort of related words. And so we can't make protein without nitrogen. You can't build muscle without nitrogen. Plants don't use as much nitrogen. They don't make muscle. But what do they make where there's a lot of nitrogen? They make seeds. That's where their nitrogen is. Go ahead. Um, yep, so nitrogen fertilizers, it's abundant in the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, of whatever we're breathing right now, 78% of it is nitrogen. It's just here. So the hard part is getting it from here floating around in the atmosphere and getting it inside our body and inside the plants. So um, again, it, nature normally can cycle n nitrogen through the system really well, but it's only when we remove all this from agriculture and then we concentrate our agriculture food in cities, and we're putting the nitrogen where? Inside all of our human bodies. We're storing all the nitrogen on the planet, in us, in our protein, in our flesh, in our animal flesh, in all those cows that we're eating. Uh, it's all getting stored <laughs> up there. Okay, next. So what is a fertilizer? Um, I think it's a substance that you add to soil to provide the nutrients that the plant needs to grow. And I call things amendments that our substances we add to add physical properties like pore space or water holding capacity. So I never think of compost as a fertilizer. It doesn't add enough nutrients. I call it an amendment because it's making habitat for the bacteria and other things to grow. Go ahead. So here's the percent nitrogen of different nitrogen fertilizers. Compost only has one and a half percent nitrogen on the average. There's your various cow, horse, and pig manures, sheep manure. Here's, here's why chickens are good. They've got a lot of nitrogen. Look at your green manures. That's good too. That's your plow down of those living green plants, especially legumes. This is a mined nitrate that has been allowed in organic systems but because it's rather unsustainable, because it's coming all the way from Chile, first it's being mined, so we're digging big hillsides out, then it's being transported all the way up here for us organic growers. A lot of uh, organic companies are considering not letting that be used anymore. Uh, you can use fish emulsion. Tankage is from Packerland Packing. So these bottom ones are, are not used in organic farming. Uh, tankage is not allowed. Um, actually, fish meal is allowed. That should be up over here. Um, blood meal is not allowed by Organic Valley, but it is allowed by other growers, other companies that are organic. Blood meal just means over here at Packerland Packing, when the cow's throat is slit, they actually drain out all the blood, they collect it, they dry it, they flake it, and then if you want, you go ahead and put that on your garden, but I'm not putting it on mine. <laughs> It's a good source of nitrogen, though. <laughs> Works for us. <laughs> and if you're an organic valley grower, you can't use it because that's just, who knows what's in that blood. Did you have a question? I didn't know what tankage was. Tankage is where you take the hide and the hoofs and guts and other things that, um, from Packerland Packing, 
Like Jello on it? <laughs> you, you, it's the protein. Jello is protein. Yeah. And you throw it in a vat and you di digest it all with acid and that's tankage. Okay. And we don't put that on our organic fields either. Yes? What's the difference between your fish and your fish meal? Um, not a whole lot. This is just con usually more dried and flaked. And an emulsion is where it's a suspension. It's all liquidy. Um, so not a whole lot of difference and I don't know why. I, th I think I was... I don't know why I didn't uh, switch these two. But we don't want to use blood meal. And then these are the cheap ones that you can use if you are a commercial farmer. So this is part of the reason organic farming is, is expensive, is we can't use these cheap sources of nitrogen to fertilize our corn and our other crops. We have to come up here and use either green manures or our cow manures. Go ahead. Uh, so compost, small source of nitrogen, um, compost and other sources of nitrogen are expensive to transport. I say it's an amendment. It increases the fluffiness and pore space and again making the habitat for bacteria that then they can multiply and then they can feed nitrogen to the soil. Next. Um, what's the difference between organic and not organic? Organic fertilizers are naturally occurring. Non-organic are manufactured or synthesized. And um, the definitions um, that NOP stands for National Organic Program, it's just a rule making body that says, doesn't mean the stuff is organic, it just means it's approved that you can use it in an organic system. It's kind of a technical difference, but. So where, if you're if you're um, composting with worms, yeah, what is, is that more of a compost or is it a fertilizer for the like how much nitrogen? Vermicompost. So it's where you have like your kitchen scraps and you got worms, red wigglers in there, mm -hmm. and is, is Amy Spears? Yeah. Still? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So um, it's actually the worm poop. Yep. Okay. That you're using as a fertilizer, and I would say that's a pretty good fertilizer. Oh. That's better than straight compost. So vermicompost is really good stuff. And that also has other really sticky, stick together things that are really good for soil. Mm -hmm. So if you can get a hold of worm castings, worm poops, um, that would be good too. <laughs> but you should, with compost, you should be able to grow your own worms <laughs> in your soil. When we dig a spade full of soil on our farm and turn it over, um, you want to see about 50 worms per square foot. And if you go look, does that seem impossible? I heard a few moans and groans like, oh, that's too many. But if you go into a cornfield that's been corn or soy, corn or soy for the last five, six years, and you turn over a, a shovel full of soil, you'll be getting two or three worms maybe. But on our farm, when it rains, um, and you know the earth, Worms come out. Or the worms come out of the ground to escape the the water. The road in front of our farm is slick with worms because they, they come out, they crawl on the road, and then you go past the neighbor's field. There's no worms to come out and crawl on the road. Oh. <laughs> All right. This is just that National Organic Standards Board. Um, we talked about the blood meal a little bit. Um, you can go on to the next slide. So this is what's called a nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is the trickster molecule. It's very slippery, very tricky, and it changes shapes. So when you take a soil test, you don't actually ever measure nitrogen because it's in too many shapes and forms. You, the closest thing you can measure is organic matter. That's what's telling you how much nitrogen may be in your soil. But here's all the different forms that it exists in. So it starts out here in the atmosphere as N2, nitrogen gas, nit and then when it rains and when there's lightning, that lightning bolt is enough energy to actually do what's called fixing nitrogen and rains to earth. So we like thunderstorms because there's good energy in that and it's called juvenile addition, which means young addition. Um, volcanoes are, the, that's supposed to be a volcano. Um, that's the other place you get juvenile addition. And it goes in the ground here, it's, it fixes. Um, fixing just means it's, um, in a, it, it's in a stable place. 
in the soil. Um, if you add a bag of fertilizer, that's in the soil. Um, then if you have, these are supposed to be those legumes. It's a bad, bad drawing of a legume. Um, but they fix the nitrogen on their little nodules, and that also becomes part of this pool of soil nitrogen. Then in order for that nitrogen to get taken up by the plant, um, oh, the other place you can get nitrogen is the blue line going in is the, the poop and pee of your animals. So you get all this stuff floating around here, and mineralization is the form that it needs to be in here to get taken up by the plant, and that's usually the NH4, the ammonium form of nitro nitrogen. If it doesn't turn out to be NH4, where the nitrogen molecule binds with the hydrogen molecules, it turns into something called nitrates. It combines with oxygens, three oxygens. And then what happens to nitrates? It goes down into your groundwater and into your well water. And then you have to get your nitrogen, your nitrates tested in your well because that's a form of poison. And it can denitrify by becoming nitrous oxide and becoming a greenhouse gas and going back up into the atmosphere. So when you have this nice pool of what you think is what you have available for the plant, you know regular farmers expect to lose 30% of it this way and this way. And organic farmers expect to keep almost all of it and send it to the plant. So 30% is being lost from the system with those commercial fertilizers especially if they're put on cold, wet soils, they're going out this way. Meaning frozen fields. <laughs> yeah, so if you're putting all that manure on frozen fields, that's why we compost our manure. Yeah. Um, we're saving it. If you spread all that poop out there on frozen fields, it's too cold, it's too wet, the soil biology is not eating it and not storing it in their little bodies, and so it's going or like this. Or it's, or it's going with the soil particles and it's running off and going into the bay and feeding the algae in the bay. Yeah? These mega farms, what do they do with the manure? They got too much? They're knifing it in, which means um, they've got the big pits, the six million gallon pits that hold six months worth of poop. And er, er, when can you spread it? You can only spread it in the spring and the fall when there's not a growing crop on it. So you're, you're going to see all these manure tankers running around here shortly. Yeah. And what they're doing is taking that, that poop out to a field site. And the good farmers are knifing it in, which means they're hooking up to a tractor that has big shanks that go below the ground. And they're actually sending it right into the earth. Hopefully it's not doing this. But if it stays cold and wet long enough, it'll do this. But if you leave it up on top, it'll do this. So. The olden days, we used to see more um, daily spread, daily haul of manure from a stanchion barn or something like that. You don't see that nearly as much as you used to. It's, it's all pits now. And I like to think that there's a certain carrying capacity of the land for how many cows per acre you should have. And I think in Brown County, especially Eastern Brown County and Kiwanee County, with all the capos, You've exceeded your carrying capacity. There's nowhere to put your shit anymore. <laughs> there just isn't. And so the big farms are driving up land prices. Was that on tape? Damn. <laughs> 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 the, the big farmers are driving up land prices um, for rentals and for purchasing just because they need a place close by to the main farm to spread the poop. So I just want to add, while we're looking at the thunderers up there, so this is a point in our culture where we have ceremonies for the thunderers, and though we weren't scientists many, 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 many years ago, we knew that that thunder was really important to our growing season. And so now we know, since it's been proven by science, but we knew this before, that thunder is really important. So when you are listening to the thunder and you're putting your tobacco down, and you're watching the lightning, you know this is going to help your plants. This is going to help everything with nitrogen. Put that on your papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so what we're trying to do here in organics is just have this cycle where the plants take it up, the cows eat it, 
Um, we do send meat and milk off the farm, but they poop it again and we reuse that. We keep this cycle going and we add new nitrogen by adding these plants. But we don't have to add this kind of nitrogen. You see how we can almost do it almost all uh, self-contained on the farm, but just getting these plants to get the nitrogen out of the air and into the ground. Um, I would say also you should think about for your gardens and your corn plot, just go over to the, the beef farm and get yourself a pickup load of poop and add that and make your own compost with that. I mean, why not, right? There's a lot of poop over there to spare. Yeah? I think there is, actually. <laughs> but, I mean, if you had a couple garbage bags, or not bags, you know, the, the cans, uh, find a friend with a pickup, um, put those in the back of your truck, and just get it filled up and go um, compost it or put it on your garden, but then wait that 90 days um, before you would eat anything out of your garden. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so this, this is, again, just showing that part of the slide, the lightning, um, the soil bacteria. Um, if you're manufacturing it, it's very expensive. Did you know that industrial fixed nitrogen, so there's a process called the Haber-Bosch process. This is an outcome of World War II and manufacturing bombs and nitrates and all those wonderful things. There's a guy who figured out how to get the nitrogen out of the air by using, instead of lightning, by using energy, by using um, fossil fuels. So nitrogen can be a very expensive thing, and we humans are adding 10 million tons of nitrous oxide, <coughs> nitrogen gas, to the air because we're adding so much fertilizer to our crop fields. It's coming all the way here. It's going all the way up in the atmosphere. <coughs> so our industrial systems are putting way more nitrogen into the ground and back up into the air than we than Earth normally has. We're getting way out of balance with nitrogen. So it's not just CO2. Go ahead. So again, the organic farmers were using manure, the bacteria, and the green manures. Okay, next. So we're growing our own nitrogen. <clears throat> There's something called a per acre furrow slice. So you know what a furrow is? Like when the plow goes through a field and it turns over a furrow? You have that image in your mind? That's a furrow slice. And so if a furrow slice, for each 1% of organic matter you have, you'll have 1,000 pounds of nitrogen in the soil. Most of it's in that fixed form, but about 20 to 30 pounds of it get in that form that the plant can use every year for each 1% of organic matter that you have. So how much? Nitrogen does a corn plant need, uh, an acre of corn? How many pounds of nitrogen does a corn acre need in a year? A ton. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Anyone else have a guess? To grow 100 bushels of corn, how much nitrogen do you need? You need about 100 pounds of nitrogen to grow 100 <laughs> pounds of corn. So some of the Iowa and Illinois prairie soils, they're growing 200 bushels of corn per acre. Our Shano County, where our farm is, is 120 bushels per acre. We actually beat our county averages most years, and we're organic. We have higher yields than most of our neighbors, mostly because of that organic matter. So in wet years, we really beat the county average. In dry years, we really beat the county average. <laughs> In average years, we're average. But when was the last time you had an average year? It, it, it's an average, so usually you don't get average years, and so we really outperform our neighbors most of the time. But our soil has 3.5% organic matter. So it contains 3,500 pounds of this fixed nitrogen and about 105 pounds of the kind of nitrogen the corn plant needs. So if it only needs 120 pounds to make 120 bushel of corn, we're almost there just because of the organic matter we have in our soil. So if Jonhinkwa is down at 2.5, 2.6, you only got um, about 28,000 
2,800 pounds of nitrogen in the soil and you're at about 80 pounds of nitrogen. That's not enough for your corn. So you would have to be adding some other form of nitrogen. So if we can improve the organic matter in the soil, we're going to make more nitrogen available to the plants. It's pretty simple. Um, we're going to increase the soil livestock. I think we already saw this slide, but that's what we're trying to do is increase the compost, increase the livestock, grow our own nitrogen. Uh, we're going to just take a quick look at some of the beneficial livestock in biology, the fungi, the worms, arthropods, which are good bugs, which eat bad bugs, bacteria, and we're going to add nutrients. Uh, this is a springtail, and it feeds off the, corn, the cakes and cookies that I showed you. It's feeding off that soil, um, root nodule stuff. This is the clover plant. Uh, these are the nodules on the roots, and that's um, the legumes that are I guess I should put this slide earlier so you know what a legume is. <laughs> Instead of having talked about legumes and now tell you what it is. Um, and these, this is something called, oh, you can go ahead, the soil food web. Uh, it's just a different way of looking at all the good critters that are in the soil. And you probably haven't thought about many of these. Most of us, when we think about soil organisms, we'll think about um, earthworms. And that's about it. So again, it's just, what is our plant? It's carbon dioxide and water with the sun's energy, a few minerals from the plant, I mean from the rocks, a little bit of rain, and we make a plant. And we end up making bread, basically. <laughs> well, we don't make the bread. <laughs> we just use the wheat or the plants, but nature makes the bread, and we just collected at the end of the growing season. So that's how you can make bread from stones. <laughs> you really can. I mean, and we again, we don't do it. But that's a miracle, right? And in our Christian culture, we say Jesus did this miracle. Well, so does nature just do it. It just takes a couple million years to happen. But it happens. Oops, go back one more. So you've got, the, again, the minerals, the sun, a little rain, little carbon dioxide and nitrogen from the atmosphere and we should be able to grow our food sustainably and make the bread. Okay, I think that's it. Great. Mm -hmm.